forward, we're good to go. Hey everybody, welcome to our Norton Sports Health Training Program Tuesday talk. Let me get my screen off here so you can see our lovely faces. <laughs> All right, again, this is the 2022 Norton Sports Health KDF Training Program Tuesday talk. So um, we put together a comprehensive schedule to help keep you on track. And these virtual Tuesday talks have kind of carried over from our 2021 year that um, still giving you good some good information virtually in case you can't make some of the training runs and ask us face to face. So uh, just a couple housekeeping things before we, be we begin. Um, again, I'm Stephanie Fish, your training program coordinator, and I hope to see you all at these group runs that we do on Saturdays and Tuesdays. But again, virtually we do our Tuesday talks. You are off camera, no one has their camera on, and everyone is also muted. And the biggest thing about this Tuesday talk is we understand everyone is busy and you might not be able to make it live. So we do post this in our Facebook group uh, after the Tuesday talk is over so you can still get this great information. So let's get started. Um, many of you might know and or remember Dr. Robin Curry from last year's Tuesday talk as well as just general KDF work. She is no stranger to the Kentucky Derby Marathon and mini marathon. So um, welcome, Dr. Curry. Why don't you kind of give us your own little background on um, how long you've been with KDF. And also, I know you're an avid runner yourself. Yeah. So I've been part of the KDF, I guess, since I started with Norton. So that would have been in 2014. So it's been quite a while actually volunteered even while I was a medical student as well. Um, and then my hist own history with the KDF as a runner, actually I started running it when I was in high school. So it's been kind of a, a long standing history with me, always something I really look forward to. Um, I like to see the runners, you know, I'd much rather see you out there on the course than seeing you in my office. So it's much more fun for me um, to see you as you pass the finish line versus seeing me because of an injury. So it's something I'm really passionate about and kind of that's been with me almost my whole life. Awesome. Yes, uh, we thank you for all your work with KDF as well. We know that it's a passion for you. So thank you. Um, that's why we're bringing you on today. This topic, I think this topic is uh, very valuable for all of our runners in our training program and even those not in our training program. Uh, we have our longest run coming up, uh, not this coming weekend, but the following so that is either the 20 mile run for our marathoners or uh, actually the following week is our 12 mile run, which is the longest for the mini marathoners. So um, they're really working their way up there in the mileage. And there's some questions on maybe how they should be feeling for that long run. And then further questions into the tapering after the long run. And then just generally, what is rest? A lot of people are confused on uh, what is rest? So I know you have a little presentation for us and um, we can go through that and you can kind of chit chat about it. Um, but before we move on, I just want to make sure you guys know we're live. So throw those questions down in the Q&A section. We will get to them. Don't be afraid to ask a question. Any question is a great question. So the Q&A section on the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen there is where you're going to want to throw those questions out at any time during the presentation or while we're talking or Beginning, end, it doesn't matter. Whenever it comes to you, throw them out there. So take it away, Dr. Curry. All right, I'm gonna do my best here. I'm not a Zoomer, so I will try to make it look how it's supposed to look. So give me just a minute. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna to talk today about the tips on tapering, on how to rest, and then also kind of what to expect on the long run. Try to move this out of the way here, okay. Um, so today we'll kind of talk about the importance of the long run and the rest and the taper and all of those are really important in order to make um, your race day a success. So that's our goal. You guys have been putting in all the time and effort. We want you to have a good, good day on race day and feel like you're prepared um, because that makes the race much more fun for everyone if that's the case. So we'll talk first about the long run. So I know as everybody's um, kind of gearing up for this. So what is the long run? It's really a relative term, right? So what's long for one person may not be long for somebody else. This is a picture of my four-year-old twins, like their long run is around the block, right? But for us, probably not a, not a long run. 
Um, so it's usually about one and a half to two miles longer than what your average kind of weekday run is. Sometimes it's longer than that, but the long runs build the aerobic fitness, which is really the most important part of the long run and really stress the body's ability so that it can adapt, which then makes those future runs that you're gonna do in the training and also on race day uh, much easier. So long uninterrupted bouts of exercise, so which is exactly what you're doing during the long run, increases your capillary density, improves your ability to transport oxygen efficiently to those muscles, and then also build strength in the muscles and in the tendons. So thinking about how to approach the long run. So I think it's important that first of all, you don't look too far into the future with regards to mileage. So I think sometimes you get that race day or the training plan and you look towards the end and you see those really long runs ahead. And sometimes that can be overwhelming. Sometimes it can be intimidating. So really just kind of take it one step at a time, I think is really important. And then as you're preparing for the run, really try to visualize that run in a positive manner. So we always think about kind of the power of positive thinking. But imagine yourself out there on your course, imagine yourself having that good run um, and finishing it strong. Also, again, when you're talking about those long runs, like the 20 mile run ahead here, try to break that up in your mind. So don't think about it as a 20 mile run, but think about it more in increments, right? Just four or five mile runs. So it's a lot easier to, to kind of wrap your mind around that versus thinking about that long extended um, run. And then I always put this in here, kind of embrace the suck. So that's something that our sports psychologist always talks about. There are going to be times during the run where it's just may not feel the best and that's okay. And that's normal. Embrace it, move on, keep that positive thinking um, so that you can finish that, that run and finish it strong. So when you think about the long run, it's also really a good time to kind of try out works best for you with regards to fueling, and with regards to, to gear. So it's a good time to figure out what's gonna work for you for that pre-race meal, right? You don't wanna try out a new race on, try out a new meal on your race day and end up in the porta potty all morning because it was something new for you. We're trying to find one again during the race. Um, also wanna try those kind of goos and powders and chews and, and see what tastes good to you, what isn't gonna upset your stomach, all those things prior to race day, again, to kind of maximize that race day. And also try out your clothing, right? So make sure that you're not wearing something that might cause chafing or that's socks that are gonna cause blisters. Wanna find that out ahead of time. See, make sure those headphones are gonna work appropriately, find out the music that you like. So trying to plan everything ahead of time so that the race day, it feels just like another practice because you've already practiced this uh, before. And also kind of with the long run is thinking about your pace. So making sure that you're pacing yourself on your long run. So you should really aim for a slower than race pace. So conversation pace is a good mark. If you look at this chart here and then you look at the turquoise area, um, think about kind of keeping it in that range. So that moderate activity where you're still somewhat comfortable and you can still hold a conversation is gonna be a good pace for you. And I did wanna mention just especially kind of from the medical side, of the long run is when you should stop, right? Because sometimes there's gonna be times when you're out on a long run and you're not really sure if you can make that difficult decision on whether to bail on it or not. And sometimes that's gonna happen and there's no way around it. So things that would cause you to think about, think twice about it, say maybe I do need to stop, um, would be kind of developing a sharp pain during your run, something that's new. So something different than the normal soreness that we would typically see on the long run. You know, you're going to have that soreness and that's normal, but a new sharp pain would make you want to stop. Pain that changes your gait pattern. So I think that's a big one and probably the most important one. Um, if you feel like you're walking or you're running with a limp, probably ought to think twice about finishing, maybe, you know, go to a walk and try to do that on another day. Obviously, if you can't bear weight, I think that goes without saying probably should stop as well. Um, but those things that change your gait pattern could really turn a minor injury into something much bigger. And so that's what we're trying to prevent is trying to prevent those major injuries that are going to keep you from being able to participate on race day. Um, also, if you feel a pop followed by some increased pain, that would make you want to stop as well. And then also just thinking about kind of illness. So this is not only while you're doing the, the run, but also should I even start the long run? So do you have a fever? Do you have chills? Um, dizziness, lightheadedness. So even before the race or before your long run, if you're feeling that, probably a good day to stay home and maybe kind of revisit it tomorrow, see how you feel, but really listen um, to your body. Also, when you're running, if you feel like you're getting overheated, you know, and especially um, as we get later into this training cycle in Kentucky, the temperatures can be so different. You really have to pay attention to those signs too, so we don't turn into something bigger. 
So kind of moving on to rest, right? So why should we rest, especially after the long run? So you really need rest for recovery and recuperation. So every time you run, your body has to adapt in order to get stronger. So with running, you, um, or with running or with exercise in general, you create these microscopic tears in the muscles. And so then the body uses the nutrients and the proteins to repair and rebuild these muscles to make the muscles stronger. But this only occurs when you get rest. So without rest, the body keeps breaking down, which then leads to those overuse injuries, which we don't like here in the office. And then the same thing occurs with bone. So the constant impact of running really, really stresses, um, the bone, sorry, I went too far. So the, the impact of the running really stresses the bone. So this increases the cell turnover and forces the bone to remodel um, to make it stronger. But again, if it never gets a break, it doesn't have time to, to repair. And that's when we see those stress injuries. So stress reactions, stress fractures, those bony injuries that we typically will see, you know, at the beginning of the training cycle, it seems as people are really starting to get it back into running. But also we see it around this time where that mileage is really increasing too. People are getting more comfortable, increasing their speed. Um, so rest is a big part of trying to prevent those, those injuries. So when you think about rest, there's kind of different ways to think about it. So you can rest for the short term, which is like the hours after activity. Um, and then there's also for the long term, which be the rest days or the weeks that are really built into that annual training plan. So short-term rest would include your cool down after a run or the low intensity exercise um, after a workout. And then from there, you can really kind of split the rest up into either an active recovery or passive recovery or active rest or passive rest. So active recovery is when you're performing those low intensity low intensity exercises, you know, after a strenuous workout. So this would be like stretching, walking, yoga, swimming, foam rolling, those sorts of things. And then passive recovery is just um, complete rest. So when you look at, you know, at the training program, you'll see that those rest days are built in, right? You're resting one to two days a week, again, to kind of let that body heal. When you're thinking about how you should rest after the race. So that's also important, right? We shouldn't go from one race straight into the next race. Cause again, that's where we're going to see those overuse injuries. So you would, for the half marathon and marathon, it really just differences, really just differs in probably the amount of time you're, you're recovering here. So with the half marathon afterwards, you'd maybe want to take kind of that passive recovery, take one to three days completely off, and then think about doing those active recovery for about seven to 10 days following the, the passive recovery. And so you would choose an activity and then kind of stick maybe to an hour or less, keep your heart rate to about 60 to 75% of the max, um, and just kind of lower intensity biking, that sort of thing. Whereas the marathon is going to be a little longer. So seven days completely off and then do the active recovery um, for about two weeks afterwards. And then you can kind of restart those training cycles. So then lastly, the tapering. And I think that, you know, this goes along with rest, right? You build these into those training programs. So the taper really, the definition is the reduction of the training load leading up to a goal race or goal event. So you're really progressively reducing the physiological, the psychological stress of daily training um, and preparation. So the goal here, the big goal is just to decrease the fatigue. And so by decreasing the fatigue, then hopefully you're leading to that optimal performance, but without the loss of training adaptations that you get um, through your training cycle. And so the way you taper here is you decrease kind of one or a combo of the three parts of your training. So either the volume, the intensity, um, or the frequency. So there are different types of taper. Um, so the one is called the step taper. So that's down here. So that's a really a sudden reduction in your training load. So if you're running 40 miles a week, you may decrease your load by half or 50% to 20 miles a week. And so it's really a non-progressive type of taper. And this is really the least effective of all the tapers. So that's not something we really recommend. Um, the linear taper maintains the highest volume of all of the tapers. So you can see it here. So here you do a gradual and standard reduction in the training load. So if you, you may reduce your training load um, by two miles per day until race day. So it's a pretty consistent reduction. Then the last one is the exponential taper. And so you can see there's two, there's a, a slow decay and a fast decay. And so the slow decay taper, there's a greater reduction in training load um, at the beginning of the taper. And then the training load really almost levels off at around 40 to 50% of your training volume. And so compared to that with the fast decay, the taper, there's an even greater reduction in training at the beginning of the taper. So it happens more, you know, happens faster. 
but then the training load is reduced to only 20 to 30 percent of normals. And this is really the most effective type of taper if you actually look at the data and the research as far as that's concerned. So the reason why we taper, so there, there are really lots of physiological changes that occur as a taper, as because of the taper. So extra, excess carbs are stored as glycogen in your muscles and in your liver. So during exercise, this is tapped as an extra energy source. So when you're tapering, you're not tapping into the sources often uh, because you're not running you know, at that higher volume. So that really builds that surplus of glycogen and then you can use that surplus um, on race day. And so studies have shown that really by doing the taper, you can increase your glycogen stores by 15%. So this is really important, especially for marathon runners, because you can decrease the risk of hitting the wall. And so the wall is the point when a runner's glycogen or stored energy within the muscles is depleted. So we really want to build that glycogen for race day. And that's why the tapering, one of the big reasons that the tapering is so important. Other things that affect that happen because of tapering is when you think about your VO2 max. So the VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen the body can use during exercise. And it really shows how well your heart pushes blood to your muscles and how efficiently your muscles can extract that oxygen back from your blood. So the higher the VO2 max, the better. Um, so through tapering and rest, your body's better able to use oxygen, which thus increases your VO2 max. Um, so looking at studies that after two weeks of decreased training volume, which again is the taper, the VO2 max increased in athletes by about four and a half to 9%. Um, also see an increase in red blood cells and a 15% increase in blood volume in, de in uh, distance runners with a taper, which is really important. And then tapering also can affect your skeletal muscle fibers. So there's two different types of skeletal muscle that we think about. There's the fast twitch and the slow twitch. So the slow twitch um, are fatigue resistance and they're aerobic in nature, so use oxygen. And these are really seen in high numbers and endurance athletes like long distance runners and also in cyclists. Whereas the fast twitch provide bigger and more powerful forces, but for shorter duration, but they fatigue much more you know, quickly than those slow twitch fibers do. So these are gonna be more abundant in power athletes like your sprinters or your weight lifters. So what we found with tapers is that fast twitch fibers grow really at an alarming rate when you taper. So that improves your power output, but doesn't change your body mass. And so it can really allow for a harder push to the finish line or really improve your economy as a runner. So when they did a study on this, they saw that a low volume or high intensity taper increased the slow twitch fibers by 7% and increased those fast twitch fibers by about 11%. Other things that can happen are hormones. So we know cortisol is a stress hormone. Um, and what it does is it stimulates protein breakdown during high stress. So high training volume is in a high stress environment. Um, and so it can also suppress the immune system, which they can then lead to illness and then lead to injury. Um, so tapering has been shown to decrease those, those cortisol levels, so that reduces the risk of having those um, things happen. Testosterone is also affected by the tapering. And so testosterone really stimulates the protein formation but when you have those high training loads, it actually decreases. So if you're tapering, you're going to see an increase in that. And you really need those proteins when we're talking about muscle healing, tendon healing, that sort of thing. And then one of the major goals of tapering really is to reduce fatigue and increase the time it takes to get to fatigue. So tapering has been shown to really reduce the mental and the physical fatigue that we see as you're training in these long distances. So essentially what happens is your goal race pace will just feel easier because you put in that time. Uh, so I liked this study, this chart from this um, that is listed here. So it came from a study where runners who were running 50 miles a week did a one week taper. And so they had split them up into three groups. There was a rest only kind of taper group who did no running for the week. There was a low intensity, intensity moderate volume taper group who reduced their weekly mileage to 18 miles at a relaxed pace and then rested completely the last day. And then there was the high intensity, low volume group who decreased mileage to, to six miles for the week, but then increased their exercise intensity. So the rest group only had a 3% um, increase in their time to fatigue. The low intensity, moderate volume taper group had a 6% increase in time to fatigue, but the high intensity, low volume group had a 22% increase in time. So it just shows the importance of although you're reducing your volume, really increasing the intensity, especially towards the end of the training, that's really crucial. So when you look at the overall benefits, I just kind of wanted to share those. It really, 
there are so many when you're thinking about tapering. Um, and I think the most important again, is it boost your athletic performance? Everybody wants to have a good race day. So then the question is really how, how do you taper, right? And so there are different ways you can look and find different literature about their best way, but overall the length should be, can be anywhere from one to four weeks. Um, two weeks is probably the optimal length when we're thinking about that. When you think about your training load, so you really want to decrease the volume. So that can be that linear decrease or that exponential like we talked about. And really it's a progressive reduction of 44 to 60% of volume really read the, to the best performance changes. Um, but you have to keep the intensity high. And so this is really the most important thing to remember that the gains can't be maintained if the intensity is reduced, even if the volume and the frequency stay the same. Um, but again, you can reduce the, reduce the frequency, reduce the volume, but the intensity has to stay the same. So your mileage would be reduced there. When they did the studies, they found that by doing that, you had anywhere from a one to 6% improvement in time just by adding that taper into your training program. So some final points, points here about training. So um, number one, just follow the training program. There's been a lot of thought that's been into it, thinking about rest days, thinking about tapering, making sure that you're getting those long runs in so you know, you know what it feels like. Um, and while you're running, listen to your body because you know if you're having an injury, if you're having aches and pains, just get it checked out. So that's what I wrote on here, ask for help and don't suffer. See your primary care doctor, see an orthopedic, sports medicine, see a physical therapist, but really ask for help. Don't suffer with those injuries. Um, somebody can do some things that can make you feel better because our goal is to get you to race day. Um, and always remember why you're running. I think that's important. Sometimes as you get deeper into the training program, we forget why we started it in the first place and kind of refocus your goals as you get further along here and then have fun. So I put pictures here of my girls running. Remember what it's like when you're a kid just to run is fun. So try to keep that in mind as well. That's it. And I finished it with my favorite quote from C. Prefontaine, which I always like to put in my uh, running PowerPoints as well. So I think that's all I have here. Okay. Okay, sorry, I was on mute and I couldn't <laughs> find my mute button, geez. Okay, it's like first day in Zoom school over here. Um, okay, that was a lot of really good information. Um, and I, I came up with some questions. So uh, while I'm asking all of my questions, um, make sure you guys are putting yours in the Q&A section down there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. No question is a stupid question. We want to hear your questions. So throw them in there. Um, so going back, to, I got a lot here. I know, so, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's good though. So one of the um, one of the top questions that I get just to, to start with the long run stuff. Um, physically, you know, people do, let, let's talk marathon, for example, uh, they do the 20 mile run. And then in their mind, they're thinking, well, gosh, Marathon six more miles. How am I gonna get through that? So, I, and I understand there's a mental aspect. And as you mentioned, we are gonna we are gonna speak with a, a mental performance ex expert later on. But physically, how is that even possible? Yeah. So part of it really is building in that rest, right, and letting your body heal after you do the 20 miles, right? So the goal of those long runs is to get your body adjusted to it. And so as you continue to practice and you continue to get that mileage underneath of you those runs just become a little bit easier, but it is really important to rest. You really have and really important to think about your nutrition, right? Cause that's a big part of it. If you don't have the appropriate nutrition, you're not getting those carbs. You're not getting all those proteins. Those muscles can't heal and then it can't. And then what ends up happening, you hit the wall, right? And everybody hears about this dreaded wall, especially when they're doing their first marathon, but there are ways to prevent that. One is by planning, doing that long run, but really thinking about nutrition. You really have to have those glycogen stores. You really need to have that available so you can use that as fuel while you're running so that we um, can do it and do it comfortably, as comfortable as doing a marathon um, really can be. But it's everything that you do up into the days leading up to that day are probably more important than anything that happens on that long run. Right, yeah, um, and then you did mention something I, I definitely want to talk about. So you go out for your long run or even race day, you're approaching it and, you know, maybe you're not feeling good. Maybe you're, maybe you're, you know, you're having a sharp pain or maybe you're sick. It's okay to change your plan. Yes. It's okay to set aside the ego. Um, for example, I did a half marathon in Vegas a couple of weeks ago. I went into it very dehydrated 
And I started, as you mentioned in your slide, my knee started hurting, which then changed my gait. And then everything started hurting and I changed my plan and I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do a little walk run method here, see how it goes. So it's okay to change your plan. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And it's okay to add an extra rest day in, right? If you have, don't feel good after that long run and you need more recovery time, it's completely fine. It is not going to change your whole one, one day that you're not following the training program. Although we like for you to follow the train, it's a merely a guide, right? So one day, few, several days is not going to ruin your race day. It's better for you to listen to your body because your body is trying to tell you something that's so important. I say that all the time. I'm like, everything I'm telling you is just a suggestion. So <laughs> it's, I mean, it's kind of a good suggestion, but in the long run, it's just a suggestion. Um, I did want to talk about, so you were mentioning um, how rest and, and tapering helps improve the slow and fast twitch muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. So we do work, we try to work on our, uh, our fast twitch muscles a little bit when we do some track right. work and some yeah. hill work. Um, and I mean, maybe you just want to talk a little bit about how that could help you in the long run. Well, yeah. The long run for the long run. <laughs> right. But yeah, so, you know, incorporating in those other days, and you can do it on a long run too, but really incorporating that speed work, right? Because it's when you build those fast twitch fibers that you become not only at the end to be able to push it, but also you become more efficient as a runner. And so doing that, you can even think if you're really comfortable on those long runs, do some pickups where you're running a little bit faster at various points through that long run, that can help you too. And again, it's just all about making that long run feel easier each time that you do it. And those fast twitch fibers are great for that. If you're just working on those slow twitch fibers, really, we're not going to see those improvements that we could see if you start to really build on that with the speed work, with the hills. Um, and again, trying those pickups during the long run too. And on that, on that note, when you were talking about tapering, um, you said to, we can decrease the, the mileage essentially, but you said increase intensity. So are you referring to speed or, or yeah, maybe like, about speed, that? So like incorporating, you know, as you're bringing your mileage down, then focus more on doing like the speed work. So you're where your mileage is short, but you're going to do it at a much higher intensity. So those are good things to do as you get closer and closer to race day. It's just, we want low mileage and more, you know, faster pace and whatever you're doing. Right. So like when we do our 20 mile run and then the next week is, is, is just 12. So maybe that one's, you're working a little harder, a little Little, mm -hmm. little pickups, like you said, and, and maybe really trying to get that goal race pace that you're wanting on that day, right. right? Yeah, I certainly wouldn't think about it as your, I think sometimes we forget that when we're thinking about taper, people think it's like, okay, now's this time to rest before the race, but that's not really the case. It's more about decreasing the mileage, but still keeping the intensity at the same or increasing that intensity. So not really a rest time necessarily before. Yeah, I, and I actually wrote that down. Taper and rest does not mean sitting on your couch and eating donuts. As lovely as that sounds, right? That's not what we're, <laughs> we're not quite there to the finish line yet. So um, there is still work to be done, even though it doesn't seem like as much. And and then the last thing I put on here um, is the recovery jitters. So uh, or recovery, but the the taper jitters. So you kind of you hit that super long point, and then you see the mileage going down, and you start getting all jittery. So um, Physically. Yeah, that's the real thing. Yeah. So the mental aspect of that, right. And that's what people have found. And I think that's what they find when people, when you talk about tapering is people get super nervous about it. And there's a mental aspect because you think, well, I did 20 this week and now my mileage is going down. How am I ever going to get back up to that higher, higher mileage? But it's all about giving your body a break. So that it's got those stores that you need so that it has the energy and the fuel and time to rebuild all those muscles. Cause every time you're doing those really long runs, you're breaking those muscles down. So we really need to build those muscles, make them as strong as possible on race day. Most important thing that can be done. So trust the process and trust your training and trust that you will make it to the finish line. Yeah. There are lots. If you want to read about it, there are lots and lots and lots of studies out there. Surprisingly, maybe not surprising about tapering and why it's so important more than I even realized till I started kind of looking into it a little bit more. So it is really interesting how much all the data supports the use of a taper. So love it. I love a good taper. Um, all right. I'm just going to share my screen here. So we are coming to the end of our program here and I just want to pop up. Um, we do have two Tuesday talks left. 
Uh, and as I mentioned a couple of times here on April 12th, we are going to talk with a uh, mental performance director, Dr. Vanessa Shannon. She did Tuesday talk with me last year and she's back. Um, and we're going to talk about to, to the expected. So um, you expect certain things to happen during the race and guess what? They might happen. So we're going to talk about that. And then uh, the week of the race, we are going to chat with the official KDF race director and get all of our final race day questions asked and answered live on April 26th. So make sure you put those on your calendar. Make sure you pre-register. We want to get you that Zoom link in time. And I guess that's about it, guys. It's Tuesday, which means we run. So tonight we are at the Norton Healthcare Sports and Learning Center for indoor track work. And it's kind of chilly out and cloudy and yucky. So a great time to come inside, bring your run inside, give the track a try. We're going to do some 200 meter repeats just to keep that intensity high during a recovery week, which we're in right now. And then um, again, we hit that those long runs in the next coming weeks. So uh, take care of everybody. Thank you, Dr. Robin Curry. We will see you at the finish line for KDF. Keep an eye out for our guys. And I hope you all have a wonderful Tuesday and we'll see you next time. Thank you.